Decoration History and welcome to our next Decoration of Independent Signing Series. I'm flying solo today, my dad is not with me. Today we're taking a look at Thomas Lynch Jr. of South Carolina. We have some really, really cool stuff to tell you about Thomas Lynch Jr. But first, I need you to hit subscribe down below, leave all your comments and questions, leave a thumbs up, and hit the notification bell. Now, let's take a look at Thomas Lynch Jr. And this is Dead History. Hey guys, how's it going? TJ here with Dead History, and welcome to our next installment of our Declaration of Independence Signer Series as we're taking a look at Thomas Lynch Jr., a man from South Carolina. I hope you enjoyed our very, very special introduction today. Uh, Henry, flying solo doing the introduction all by himself. Uh, very proud moment for me. Uh, very, very proud and happy that Henry did that. I think he did a wonderful job. Uh, he's only nine years old, so I think he did a great job. And I thank you, Henry, for doing that and being brave enough uh, to do that. And uh, just a very proud moment. So really good job uh, to Henry. Uh, so yeah, very special intro there by Henry, and now the audio portion, I am going to be flying solo for most of it, uh, and you get to deal with me and not Henry, uh, sorry about that, I know that's a little disappointing, I'm sure, uh, however, I did also want to touch on uh, just saying thank you for everyone for being patient, I know we haven't released a video in uh, a couple of weeks, uh, we unfortunately got hit with a little bit of the the winter sickness. Uh, I was sick with the stomach virus last week that it kind of knocked me out for a couple of days. Uh, and then Henry, uh, he has strep throat yet again. Uh, it's like the fourth time in only a couple of months. So poor kid. Um, it just, it just never ends of course. So I apologize that we were unable to do that last week, but you know, unforeseen circumstances, uh, but we're doing better now. Everybody's doing better, and we're ready to uh, to deliver the goods, so to speak. So here we go. Uh, Thomas Lynch Jr., our next declaration signer uh, from the state of South Carolina, the third signer from South Carolina. And as Henry told you in the introduction, the only signer that technically does not have a grave site because he was lost at sea and body and ship were never recovered. We're going to get into that in more detail, of course, but this will be kind of a unique thing because there's no gravesite to show you like I always do. So a little bit of a unique perspective here for dead history. But uh, let's just jump right in and get into Thomas Lynch Jr. of South Carolina. Here we go. 
Thomas Lynch Jr., the third Thomas Lynch in his line, was the son of a gentleman of the same name and was born on August 5th of 1749 at Hopsui Plantation in Prince George's Parish, Winya, in the province of South Carolina. This handsome home exists today on 58 acres on the Santee River, on the gateway to Georgetown City and the Santee River Delta. I believe it's Santee. It's S-A-N-T-E-E, so I'm, I'm going to pronounce it Santee. It is not a restored colonial property, but rather it has been preserved largely intact by the several private owner families. This beautiful site was chosen by the Lynch family to be the home for Thomas Lynch Sr. and was built between 1733 and 1740. Hopsui overlooks the beautiful Santee River and the rice fields, which were its source of income until the Civil War. And at one time, there were about 13,000 acres owned by the family. Currently, the house is registered as a National Historic Landmark and is furnished with 18th century pieces, open to the public to tour throughout the year. And the sad thing is, I wish I could tell you guys that I actually went and saw the Hopsui Plantation in South Carolina, but the truth is I never did. Because again, in my travels in 2020, when I was doing all this driving all over the country, I never ever expected to start a YouTube channel, and I never expected to be covering uh, the Declaration of Independence signers on a weekly basis on said YouTube channel, and uh, you know, wanting to show all the uh, wonderful sights. So, unfortunately, all the photos that you're going to see of the plantation, uh, old and new. Uh, those are all stock photos. Those are not mine. Uh, so just keep that in mind that unfortunately I never visited there. The Lynch family was an ancient one and is said to have originally emigrated from Austria to England, where they settled in the county of Kent. Sometime later, a branch passed over to Ireland, and from there some of the descendants moved to South Carolina. The name of the family is said to have been derived from a field of pulse called Linz, upon which the inhabitants of a certain town in Austria lived for some time during a siege which was laid to it. Subsequently, they changed the name of the town to Linz or Linz, which name was adopted by the principal family of the place. And they have it spelled L-I-N-C-E or L-I-N-T-Z for the name of the town. Jonak Lynch, the great-grandfather of Thomas Lynch Jr., the subject of the present sketch, emigrated from Ireland to America about 1690. At his death, he left his son Thomas, the first of three individuals named Thomas Lynch, a slender inheritance, which, however, by his industry and especially by the purchase of a large tract of land that he devoted to the cultivation of rice, was increased to a princely fortune. This fortune at his death was left to a son by the name of Thomas, known as Thomas Lynch Sr., the father of the subject. Thomas Lynch Sr. was married to Elizabeth Alston, of Brook Green Plantation, another Georgetown prominent and wealthy family. And they had daughters, Sabina and Esther, and one son, Thomas Jr. After Elizabeth Austin died, Mr. Lynch Sr. married Hannah Mott, and they had a daughter, Elizabeth. Thomas Lynch Sr. was a distinguished public servant and one of the most important Santee River planters. He was the first president of the Winya Indigo Society and was elected as a delegate to the Commons House of Assembly by the people of Prince George, 
Winya Parish, where he served until his death in 1776. Having early espoused the cause of the colonists, in 1774, he was elected to the First Continental Congress. He was highly esteemed by the Founding Fathers, who in October of 1775 appointed him, along with Benjamin Franklin and Colonel Benjamin Harris, as advisors to General Washington. In February of 1776, he was paralyzed from a cerebral hemorrhage while in Philadelphia, and he never recovered his health. Keep in mind, we're referring to Thomas Lynch Sr. here, who is Thomas Lynch Jr.'s father, of course. At an early age, young Thomas Lynch Jr. was sent to a flourishing school, the Indigo Society School, at that time maintained at Georgetown, South Carolina. Before he had reached his 13th year, his father removed him from this school and sent him to England to enjoy those higher advantages which that country presented to the youth of America. Having passed some time in the collegiate institution of Eton, he entered Cambridge and received its degree in due course. There, he enjoyed a high reputation by his tutors, both in respect to his classical attainments and for the virtues of his character. This information, communicated by some friend to his father, was so highly flattering that he was induced to continue his son abroad for some years longer and wrote to him expressing his wish that he should continue study in England with a view to the profession of law. This he did, leaving Cambridge to study at the Middle Temple in London. He devoted himself with his characteristic zeal to the philosophy of jurisprudence and made the acquaintance of some of the leading politicians of the day and the ways of the government. When he heard the murmurs of discontent from his native land and listened to the haughty tone of British statesmen when speaking of the colonies, he had an irrepressible desire to return home. After an absence of eight or nine years, young Mr. Lynch returned to South Carolina. He returned an eminently accomplished man in his manners graceful and artfully clever and with a mind enriched with abundant stores of knowledge, justly the pride of his father and an ornament to the society in which he was destined to move. He soon after married on May 13th of 1772, a beautiful young lady he had known since childhood, Elizabeth Shubrick daughter of Thomas and Mary Baker Shubrick of Charleston, South Carolina. They had no children. Interestingly, Elizabeth's sister Mary married Edward Rutledge, and her sister Hannah married William Hayward, brother of Thomas Hayward Jr. Rutledge and Thomas Hayward Jr. were also signers of the Declaration. It is easy to imagine the conversations that arose at gatherings of those families. Thomas Lynch Jr. decided against the practice of law, and he became a planter like his father, who gave him peach tree plantation. He also caught the spirit of his father to stand up and breast the storm of the re revolution. From 1773, he addressed numerous assemblies with a patriotic eloquence that won hearts and the people elected him by acclamation to many civil offices of trust. He quickly became much sought after for public service, becoming a member of the colony's first and second provincial congresses and the Constitutional Committee for South Carolina, where he helped draft the state constitution. 
Well, look at here. I found a very, very special guest. Henry, how are you? Good. That's good. Uh, what's new? Anything? No. And uh, hey, man, really, really great, great job with that introduction. Thank you. Uh, yeah, that was pretty impressive, man. It really was. How, how did you feel when you were doing that? Good. Yeah, were you a little nervous? At first. <laughs> At first you were? Yeah. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Um, is it something you think you'll want to do again in the future? Yeah. You think so? Yeah. Well, that'd be good. Yeah. Um, what else can I ask you? Yeah, I was impressed. I really was. I really, truly was. So, Thomas Lynch Jr., our third signer from South Carolina. We only have one more after him. Because there's only four from South Carolina. Then we'll be moving on. And he's the only one that doesn't have a grave site, right? Yeah. Pretty interesting stuff. What do you think? Very interesting. Yeah. And the people are going to learn about his father and what happened to him. And it's pretty interesting. I was telling you all about it, right? That it was kind of interesting how you did the introduction by yourself. You kind of stepped in for me, right? That's the same thing that Thomas Lynch Jr. did for his dad, right? Yeah. He stepped in and took his place, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah, we're going to, we haven't even gotten that far yet. The people are going to learn that, but yeah, you did the same thing really that Thomas Lynch Jr. did. That's pretty cool, right? Kind of ironic mm-hmm. that you did that with the introduction. Well, yes. I know you're a man of very few words, so <laughs> I'll let you go. I appreciate you stopping in and saying hi. Welcome. And uh, hopefully we'll see you soon, right? Yes. All right, bye-bye now. Bye-bye. Thomas Lynch Jr., Patriot, Farmer, was educated at the Indigo Society School in Georgetown, South Carolina. His father sent him to England in 1764 to complete his education at Eton and Cambridge. He studied law at the Middle Temple from 1764 to 1772. On March 6th of 1767, he was admitted to the Middle Temple Law School in London. On May 18th of 1767, he began studies in Conville and Camus College, Cambridge. By the time he returned to South Carolina in 1772, he had decided not to pursue a career in law. His father presented him with peach tree plantation, and he thus became a planter. Being the only son of the prominent and wealthy Thomas Lynch Sr., he was easily introduced into public service. He was a member of the first and second provincial congresses of the Constitutional Committee for South Carolina and the First State General Assembly and the Second Continental Congress. The First State General Assembly and the Second Continental Congress, which I just said, it's just giving the dates more now here. On June 12th of 1775, the Provincial Assembly elected him one of the captains of the First South Carolina Regiment. He accepted, and in July, he went into North Carolina to recruit his company. During this service, he contracted malaria, which made him a partial invalid for the rest of his life. Of course, as always, reading from different sources, the story of Thomas Lynch is a sad one, mainly because it is so short. Yet Lynch gave himself as fully to the American cause as did John Adams, Thomas Jefferson, or Benjamin Franklin. It was simply that he had so little time in which to make his contribution. Thomas Lynch Jr. had studied law in England and served in various legislative bodies in pre-revolutionary South Carolina. Fundamentally, though, he was a planter. If the revolution had not come along, he would probably have passed his days growing rice and enjoying a life of cultured leisure. But the revolution did come along and Lynch was prepared to do his part. In 1775, while serving as captain in the 1st South Carolina Regiment, 
He contracted what was called bilis or bilis fever. Was it malaria? Yellow fever? We cannot say now, but the effect terribly weakened him for the rest of his brief life. While young Lynch had been in military service, his father, Thomas Sr., was in Congress. Thomas Lynch Jr. was never meant to sign the Declaration of Independence. But what began as filial duty evolved into an opportunity to participate in the creation of the most famous document in American history. Young Thomas Lynch Jr. was a rich planter's son who had enjoyed every advantage. He had a beautiful young wife and a plantation that his father had given to him on the South Santee River, northeast of Charleston. At age 26, he was the second youngest of the four men South Carolina sent to Philadelphia. All four, Lynch Jr., Arthur Middleton, Thomas Hayward Jr., and Edward Rutledge had studied law at a Hallow Law Guild Guild in London. All were under the age of 34, and all were perceived as overprivileged dandies. Why did South Carolina send such young men to Congress? The simple answer is that they didn't have anyone else. South Carolina wanted strong local government. The colony wanted to govern itself, period, and had mixed feelings regarding the matter of national independence. Was being governed by a bunch of northern ideologues any better than being ruled by the British? In 1774, they sent Thomas Litch Sr. to Philadelphia. He was a South Carolina delegate descended of Irishmen who had prospered in America. His people had long hated the crown and Lynch Sr., a radical despite his vast wealth and lands, could be relied upon not to rashly empower a new government. But early in 1776, the elderly Lynch suffered a stroke and was unable to leave his bed. Casting about for a substitute, South Carolina decided to send his son, Thomas Jr., to tend to his father's care and vote in Congress on various matters in his father's stead. They tossed in three other delegates, all equally young, because they could not spare anyone with more experience. Having ousted the royal government, South Carolina was busy crafting a new constitution and setting up a provincial legislative body. This is an account just kind of uh, relating to Thomas Lynch Jr. when he was over in England. This intelligence communicated by some friend to his father, Thomas Lynch Sr., was so highly flattering that he was induced to continue his son abroad for some years longer and wrote to him expressing his wish that he should enter his name at the temple with a view to the profession of law. This he accordingly did devoting himself with his characteristic zeal to the philosophy of jurisprudence and to the principle of the British Constitution. About the year 1772, after an absence of eight or nine years, young Mr. Lynch returned to South Carolina. He returned to an eminently accomplished man in his manners graceful and insinuating, and with a mind enriched with an abundant stores of knowledge justly the pride of his father and an ornament to the society in which he was destined to move. Although he was eminently qualified to enter upon the profession of law, he succeeded in in persuading his father to allow him to relinquish the pursuit of a profession which his fortune rendered it unnecessary for him to pursue. Such a preliminary course was unnecessary to entitle him to the confidence and esteem of his fellow citizens. These he had once enjoyed. In 1775, 
on the raising of the 1st South Carolina Regiment of Provincial Regulars, he was appointed to the command of a company. Having received his commission, he soon enlisted his quota of men in some of the neighboring counties and at the head of them took up his march for Charleston. Unfortunately, during the march, he was attacked by a violent bilis or bilious fever, which greatly injured his constitution, and from the effects of which he never afterwards entirely recovered. On his recovery, he rejoined or joined his regiment, but was at this time unable, from the feeble state of his health, to perform the duties of his station according to his wishes. Adding to this affliction, the unwelcome intelligence was received of the dangerous illness of his father, who was at that time attending in his place upon Congress in Philadelphia. He immediately made the necessary arrangements to hasten to a dying father, if possible to administer to him the support and consolation which an affectionate son only could impart. To his surprise, his application for a furlough for this purpose was denied by the commanding officer, Colonel Gadsden. This disappointment, however, and the controversy which grew out of the above refusal were terminated by his election to Congress as the successor of his father. He now lost no time in hastening to Philadelphia where he found his father still living and so far recovered that the hope was indulged that he might yet be able to reach Carolina. Now another source here, Thomas Lynch Jr. was born into the family of one of the prominent rice kings of South Carolina, that of Thomas Lynch and his wife, Elizabeth Austin Lynch, on August 5th of 1749. Thomas had two older sisters, Sabina, born during 1747, and Esther, born in 1748. The Hopsawee Plantation was and still is located along the North Santee River in the vicinity of Winya, St. George's Parish, present-day Georgetown County. The origin of the Lynch family leads back into Austria and from there to England. From England, a part of the Lynch family relocated to Ireland, and it is from there that John Lynch's great-grandfather, Jonak Lynch, immigrated to America. There is no information regarding when Jonak arrived, but it is thought that he settled while the colony was still in its infancy. Thomas received an excellent education, initially at the Indigo Society School in Georgetown, where he studied until he was about 13. He was transferred to a school in England, where he attended Eton, located in Buckinghamshire. I think it's Buckinghamshire, not Buckinghamshire, as I would say, to study the classics. Afterward, he attended Cambridge. Thomas excelled in his studies, prompting his father to extend his stay in England to pursue a law degree. Subsequent to studying British law at the Temple, he returned to South Carolina about 1772. Although Thomas was well qualified to practice as an attorney, he convinced his father that his wealth was quite beyond what was necessary and that there was no need for him to enter a profession. At about the same time, the colonies were nudging toward independence and the tension between the colonists and Britain was escalating at a rapid pace. Thomas Lynch, despite having lived eight or nine years in England, immediately upon his return began to become involved in politics and his sentiments were entirely on the side of the Patriots. During 1772, Thomas married Elizabeth Shubrick, who had been his girlfriend prior to departing for England when he was only 13. Thomas and Elizabeth began their married life on the Peach Tree Plantation 
near Hopsawee along the South Santee River in St. James Parish, present-day Charleston County. The plantation had been given to them by Thomas Sr. The younger Lynch had been enthusiastically involved with the South Carolinians' plight with the crown and showed no signs of distancing himself from politics despite his marriage. During 1773, Lynch spoke publicly in Charleston about the tactics of the crown and the injustices that had been thrust upon the colonists. His speech followed that of his father, but the cheers for Thomas Jr. surpassed those received by his father. The young man's voice bellowed with an eloquence that bounced off the walls and stirred the hearts of those gathered. But the one who showed the most satisfaction and pride was his father. Like his father, Thomas was determined to display opposition and side with those seeking independence if reconciliation did not occur. He attended the first and second provincial South Carolina Congresses. In addition, he attended the first state legislature and he participated as a member of the South Carolina Constitutional Committee. Lynch was available during 1775 when South Carolina raised its initial, initial regiment of provincial regulars, the 1st South Carolina Regiment, the Continental Army, commanded by Captain, later Brigadier General, Thomas Sumter. Lynch received a commission as a captain with command of a company, which for him was an excellent appointment that he measured against his experience and ability. But his father had been expecting him to have received a higher rank. Thomas Sumter and William Moultrie, two prominent leaders of the Patriots' cause, also received the rank of captain. Once he received his commission, Lynch accompanied by Captain, later Brigadier General, Chum Charles Coatsworth Pinckney raised his complement of troops in North Carolina and departed for Charleston. En route, Lynch became violently ill from fever and was compelled to detach himself from the company. Following his recovery, he rejoined his command. However, the recovery was not complete and it had so weakened him that he never regained his good health. His military career had essentially ended, although he did not leave the service at that time. His father, Thomas Sr., was in Philadelphia during 1776, attending the Congress, and he too had become seriously ill. Thomas Jr. attempted to get permission from Colonel Christopher Gadsden to depart South Carolina to get to see his father but his request was denied. The incident ignited harsh feelings between Lynch and Gadsden. Due to the illness of Thomas Sr., the South Carolinians unanimously elected Thomas Jr. to join his father, who had been a delegate in Congress since 1774. Thomas departed Charleston for Philadelphia immediately after his election. And upon his arrival, he was pleased to find that his father had survived the stroke. Thomas Sr. remained in Philadelphia recuperating, but his son again became ill. Despite the perilous state of his health, the younger Lynch refused to relinquish his responsibility as a delegate. He remained a supporter of independence and was one of the members of that group who pledged their lives fortune and honor. Thomas Sr. was too ill to participate in the ceremony. Subsequent to voting for independence and later signing his name to the parchment document, the younger Lynch initiated the journey back to South Carolina with hopes of his still ailing father making it home where he might gain full recovery. And just reading another uh, source here, Lynch Jr. was born at Hopsawee Plantation in Prince George Parish, Winyah, in what is now Georgetown, South Carolina. 
the son of Thomas Lynch and his wife, Beverly Alston Lynch. Before Thomas Lynch Jr. was born, his parents had two daughters named Sabrina and Esther. His mother was the daughter of Gilliam Marshall de Lilliard of Iberville Parish, Louisiana, whose brother George William Dilliard of Virginia is credited with changing the Dilliard name to its current spelling. Made introductions during a ball held at the childhood home of John Drayton Sr., Magnolia Plantation and Gardens. Also in attendance were prominent families such as the Middletons, Randolphs, and Rutledges. In this marriage, they gave birth to a daughter named Amy Constance in 1755, who later married John Drayton. Lynch's grandfather was Jonas Lynch from County Galway ancestral line. The Lynch family were expelled from Ireland following their defeat in the Irish Wars of William of Orange. Lynch Sr. had emigrated from Kent, England to South Carolina. Lynch Sr. was a prominent figure in South Carolina politics, which contributed to access of opportunity in high education and wealth. Thomas Lynch Jr. was schooled at the Indigo Society School in Georgetown before his parents sent him to England, where he received honors at Eton College and at Gonville and Caius College, Cambridge, or Caius Co College, Cambridge. He studied law and political philosophy at the Middle Temple in London. His father admired his English education and encouraged him to remain in Great Britain to study law and the principles of the British Constitution. After eight years away from America, he returned to South Carolina in 1772. Although it was his father's dream, Thomas Lynch Jr. decided to end his pursuit of a profession in law. Lynch Jr. married Paige Shubrick on May 14th of 1772. Following their marriage, the couple lived at Peach Tree Plantation, which was located in close proximity to his homeland plantation. He enjoyed cultiva cultivating the land and remained active in political dialogue in his community. And that source said Paige Shubrick. It is actually Elizabeth Shubrick, his wife's name. Um, I'm not sure if maybe like that was a nickname of hers, but um, definitely Elizabeth Shubrick, not Paige. So that definitely was incorrect. So, um, yeah, uh, I think that's kind of going to do it for this part one, guys. You know, you know, when it comes to Thomas Lynch Jr., there's just not a lot. You know, I mean, he died very young. Uh, tomorrow in part two, we're going to go over the death of his father. And then how that obviously elevated Thomas Lynch Jr. to basically represent South Carolina and end up signing the declaration. But then not very long after he signed the declaration, um, within a few years, he was dead. And his body and ship were never recovered. We're going to tell you all about that tomorrow, of course. But uh, there's no grave sight to see. Uh, I am going to show you, I'm going to do a, a part one bonus footage here uh, for part one. I'm going to show you uh, the Hopsui Plantation. Uh, of course, these are all going to be stock photos. I did not take any of these photos myself. I never visited the Hopsui Plantation, but I wanted to show you them uh, just so you can kind of get an idea of where Thomas Lynch Jr. was born and, you know, what kind of life he lived. Uh, especially as a younger man. So uh, I will show you that here in bonus footage. So stay tuned for that. Uh, but other than that, guys, that's it for part one. I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, and I hope you found it kind of an interesting connection. As Henry did the introduction all by himself uh, for the first time ever. Uh, and it was kind of the son replacing the father. Just like Thomas Lynch Jr. did in the uh in the life and the events of him and his father thomas lynch senior so it's kind of the son taking over and replacing the father 
Uh, so I hope you kind of enjoyed that little connection there. Uh, hope you hope you enjoyed all of this, of course. So stay tuned for that bonus footage. Thank you so much for everything, guys. Thank you for your patience with us being uh, under the weather. And thank you for the subscribes, comments, questions, all of it. Keep it coming. And we will see you tomorrow for part two and the conclusion of Thomas Lynch Jr. of South Carolina. Thanks, guys. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye now. Hey, guys. TJ here with Dead History. Uh, and I want to, of course, show you guys just some things that I found. So first and foremost, I'm going to show you the Hopsui Plantation. So this is obviously here in South Carolina. Uh, you can see, I mean, really close to the coastline, uh, Charleston. You know, it's probably, I would say, maybe an hour or so north, 60 miles or so north of Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, but this is where the Hopsui Plantation is. Now, if you see here where you have the North Santee River, uh, as you can clearly see. Uh, now, when you come in, you can see out here, you can actually see if you zoom into the street view of, oh, there it is. This is like, you know, the outskirts of the plantation. Uh, this is actually the Santee River right here uh, where this bridge goes over. There's the North Santee River. But when you zoom back out and we come out here, there is actually a couple little markers. One of them is right here on the actual plantation grounds. So there you go. There's the Hopsui Plantation uh, where Thomas Lynch Jr. was born. Look at the trees with the beautiful Spanish moss. How pretty is that? Look at that. That is absolutely breathtaking. But you can just see there's some buildings, some outbuildings here. Um, just really beautiful. Really uh, beautiful, beautiful plantation grounds. I uh, wanted to show you guys this because I thought this was fabulous. Um, does it let us go over here? It does not. Let's see if there's another view. Uh, is there any more? Oh, there's one over here. What does this one give us? No street data view is available, which is interesting because there is a, a marker. So, uh, interestingly enough. Uh, so, there's the Hopsui Plantation. Now, this is where Thomas Lynch Jr. was born. Again, coming back down. Uh, this is where he was born. This is where he grew up uh, before going off to, you know, England to be uh, obviously educated. There's a picture of it right here, uh, up here in the corner, as you can see. Now, here's what's really cool. Let's 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 really start to dive into things here now. So this is the North Santee River, uh, as you can clearly see. Okay. And there's the Hopsui Plantation um, right on the North Santee River. Now, if you come down, you actually see the South Santee River. Now, there's Hopsui, uh, you know, right across the river, basically. Now, if you look at the South Santee River, you see here where my mouse is, Montgomery Creek. Montgomery Creek, that was right next to, so right in this general area where my mouse is right here, right here along the South Santee River. That's where the peach tree plantation was. That is the plantation that Thomas Lynch Jr. and his wife, Elizabeth Shubrick Lynch, lived. That's actually the plantation that Thomas Lynch Sr. gave to Thomas Lynch Jr. That was located somewhere right along here. It was right next to the Montgomery Creek, from all the research I did, right along Montgomery Creek, which runs right about here, as you can see, you can see the creek running, um, and then right into the South Santee River, right on the bank. So that was right, like right here where this land area is. The Peachtree Plantation, there is some ruins that are still around, but most of it uh, is gone and was destroyed and burned, I believe. A long time ago in the 1800s, I believe uh, that is what I read. So that's no longer standing. It's not like Hopsui. Now, if you look, so that's where he lived. And then right across the river there, that's where he was born at Hopsui. So it literally was real close. But that is where Peachtree Plantation was. And then, of course, 
Hopsawi Plantation on the North Santee River. That's where he was born. So just to give you a little perspective of uh, everything from Thomas Lynch Jr., signer from South Carolina. Thanks, guys. Enjoy the pictures now. Remember, all stock photos. I never visited these sites. Thanks, guys.